Number one, grace. Say it with me. Unearned favor. Acceptance. A gift. An undeserved blessing. Let's say it again. Number one, say it with me. Grace. Say it out loud. Unearned favor. How many here have ever had God give you an unearned favor? Right? Somebody yesterday, uh, we were, they gave me a gift card to Olive Garden. And, and, I, and I, I called them to thank them. And they told, they told me, Pastor, you deserve it. And I said, I know what you're saying, and that's nice, but actually, I deserve to go to hell. <laughs> I don't deserve anything I have. But because God is a God of grace, I have everything that I have. How many thank God for grace on your life? Somebody say amen. It means acceptance. It means a free gift. The other uh, while back, a few months ago, me and my wife, uh, we were able to bless Pastor Nite with a beautiful BMW, white one. We put a red bow on top of it, and I don't think anyone's ever given her something that nice. And she cried, and it touched our heart. It was, oh man, it was a mo it was a week recorded and everything. It was a beautiful. And she drove her way in that BMW. And I look at some of you are hating. Look at, how can they, look at, that's what's wrong with you. Come on, someone, I've got to break that off you. Some of you will be like, yeah, I'm next. Some of you are like, I don't know. Help us, Lord. But we didn't tell her, Nita, you can have it with these strings attached. No, we said, that's yours. Here's the pink slip. Do whatever you want with it. Do it. You know, do whatever you want to do with it. It's yours. Because it's a gift. She didn't earn it. She didn't deserve it. We gave it to her because we loved her. How many know God has given you his son, Jesus, not because you earned him, not because you deserved him, but because he loved you. Come on, clap like you have a gift from God. Amen? Grace. It also means undeserved blessing. Somebody say undeserved blessing. Now, that's awesome because how many have blessing in your life that you know you didn't deserve? I remember, like, when God told me that my wife, Elizabeth, was going to be my wife. And I was like, Rabba Shanda Kata Kashata. I didn't speak in tongues before that, but I got baptized in love juice. Come on, somebody. I was like, praise God. I'll, I'll serve you anywhere. I'll go, I'll go to the jungles of Argentina, Lord. Come on now. With her. But the truth was, I didn't deserve her. But when I, remember, I remember when we got married, it was like for about a month. I just kind of was shocked. Even this morning when I saw her, I was like, man, God. It always just like, man, God, that's, that's, that's your undeserved blessing on my life. How many have some things in your life that you could say, man, that is just the grace of God upon my life. You, I mean, thank God for three claps and an amen. Well, so we're going we're gonna to go. We're going to just keep, we're gonna keep going here. Now, when they first gave me Joshua, my, my, my son, you know, some of you know the story of Joshua. They told us to abort Joshua. Uh, uh, they told us, you need to set the appointment up today. We didn't do it. We stood on the word, and now Joshua's 12 years old. He's healthy and, as ever. But I remember them giving me Joshua right when he was born, and I'm holding him, and I remember putting my little pinky in his mouth and because, you know, he's a little tiny guy, and I just cried. And I even have a picture. I just like, oh, and I'm thinking, this is an undeserved blessing. I think about my joy. I think about little Noah. I think about my life. I think about being a pastor of this amazing church. I think about all the things that God has allowed me to do. And I could honestly say it's all the grace of God upon my life. And I want to share the grace with you today. Come on, how many want some undeserved? Come on, clap like this is powerful. Now, like, we're believing God for a building, right? Um, you know, this one keeps get, it's getting full, and by this time next year, this will be full. And we're going to need another building. And so we're saving money, and it's awesome. We're putting money away, and, and we're going to keep believing God to save millions, and, 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 and we're going to be able to go get a building. 
how many believe that's 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 your, that's your that's what we're gonna do. That's what we're gonna do. we're raising money and. But I wanna I want God to also at the same time as we're raising money and we're being responsible and we're gonna do our part. I want God to give us a building that's just undeserved. I want I want I, I want when we move into our new building, I want people to go, what happened? What is? Th- and we don't, we're not going to sit back and go, you know, uh, we're going to be like, man, that's grace exchange right there. Come on, say amen. How many are believing God for some undeserved blessing? Some, no, 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 no. How many are believing God for some undeserved blessing, undeserved favor, some gifts? Come on, give God a shout like you believe in the grace exchange. In John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus said, it is finished. Somebody say, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. When he said it was finished, what did he mean? And what, what does that mean? It is finished. What's finished? Well, you have to go back to the Garden of Eden to understand this. Because in the Garden of Eden, you have Adam and you have Eve. And they make a terrible mistake. They sin. And when they sin... It, it brought the curse. Because anywhere there's sin, the curse is going to be there. So there's sin, and once sin came in, all of a sudden, sickness came in, distress, shame, condemnation, poverty, depression, all kinds of weird vices and bondages. All that was the result of sin. It ruined man at a molecular structure. Literally, his DNA changed. It went from being in the image of God to literally being cursed. And Jesus is what the Bible calls the second Adam. He came to restore back everything the devil stole from the first Adam. So on the cross... He was going to destroy the source of mankind's plague, dilemma, and curse, which was sin. Get rid of the sin, get rid of the sickness. Get rid of the sin, get rid of the the depression. Get rid of the sin, get rid of the fear. Get rid of the sin, get rid of condemnation. Get rid of the sin, get rid of poverty. Get rid of the sin, get rid of shame. Every plague in humanity, every bondage, everything that trips men up, everything that hurts men, causes pain, is the result of sin. And so God said, if I can get the sin out, then I can get the bondage out. I can get the curse out. I can get the poverty out. I can get the sickness out. I can get the depression. Come on, somebody clap. This is powerful. So Jesus goes onto the cross. And on the cross... The Bible says that he became sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It's in your notes. You can read it later. He became sin so you could become the righteousness of God. That's what he did on the cross. He did that, and we don't know exactly how it looked in the spirit. We know how it looked kind of in the physical because the Bible said he was marred above every man. That means he was... He was more mutilated than any man that we'd ever, we'd ever seen. Well, we know that just wasn't from his beating because other men have been beaten worse. No, there was some point on the cross where he took the full weight of Adam's sin, mankind's sin. And at that moment, he was marred more than any man. At that moment, he took Adam's sin, which was every man's sin, every man's sin, every man's mistake. And at that point, he took every man's sickness, every man's poverty, every man's failure. Right there on that cross, he took all of it. Every single last bit of it, he didn't deserve to take it. He, just, he, didn't, he didn't earn to take it. There was nothing that, he, there's, there's no reason he should have took it other than his love for you and for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. Somebody clap like when he said, it is finished, it was finished. So on the cross, He takes all of this. Now, we don't see it in the natural, but in the spiritual, we know it happened from Scripture. 
Now look at Isaiah 53. This talks about the cross. Read it with me. He has borne our what? Come on, our what? Now that word grief translates sickness. So right there, he took, he bore our sickness. Somebody thank God he took our sickness. Next week, we're, we're going to do Holy Communion. And we're going to be believing for healing next week. Now, I, I've known people in our church, and I know people in my own family, that they're, um, they're, 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 they're uh, and the doctors will do this, and so, so will um, insurance companies. They'll say, is there any diabetes in your family? Is there any types of sicknesses that, that your fam- that's in your family line? Because um, they, they can basically say, if it's in your family line, then it'll eventually be in your line. Because the DNA of your parents are in you, and therefore the same thing that happened to them is pretty much going to happen to you. We can pretty much guarantee that. And I had one girl here that she, like, her grandma had cancer, her grandma had cancer, her mom had cancer, and now the doctors were telling her, you don't have cancer, but this organ in your body needs to be removed because that's what can become cancerous. And I remember telling her, everything the doctors have told you is right, but what you don't understand is that when Adam fell, he fell, his body literally fell at a molecular structure. And when Jesus took that sickness on the cross, he, not, he, he broke that sickness at a molecular structure and he restored you at a molecular structure. She's like, what does that mean? That means you have a different bloodline and a different DNA in you. And if you would receive what God did, you don't have the blood of your ancestors. You have the blood of God. And the blood of God can heal cancer. Come on. Somebody, somebody clap like the blood of God can heal a cancer. Somebody clap like the blood of Jesus can heal diabetes. Somebody clap like the blood of Jesus can heal diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. Somebody clap like Jesus is a healer. Come on, somebody say amen. That's grace. He was wounded for our sickness. Well, let me keep reading. He, was, he bore our sickness, carried our sorrows. How many of you ever had sorrows here? You went through a death. I ran into a, a young person recently. And I hadn't seen her in maybe 10 years. And it broke my heart. Because I saw a sorrow on her. But that sorrow happened 10 years earlier. But here she is, young in her 20s, and the sorrow that happened to her 10 years ago was still on her. And it's, I see it all the time as a pastor. People come, they, people, people come to church, they go, and then I'll see them years later, and they, look, they don't look right. They look like they've been in a lot of, a lot of stuff. And a lot of times, that's a sorrow that's happened. Somebody died. Somebody went through a hardship. And because they don't know how to receive the God's grace in that area, what he, he took that sorrow, they, don't know how to, they carry it. And mankind was never meant to carry all that. See, and they walk around heavy. And they get old. And their body breaks down. And their emotional life. And they become addicted to drugs and alcohol and perversion. Because they're carrying this thing that God said, if you just humble yourself... And receive my grace exchanged by faith. I'll take the sorrow and I'll give you joy. Somebody clap like you're about to give. Come on, have an exchange. I see that all the time. People get, they become Christians and they, they look tired. They look old. They look wore out. They're in their 30s and they look wore out. Wore out. All of a sudden they start coming to church. Then they go to freedom family class. Then they go to Lifestyle of Freedom. They start serving. And six, seven months later, they look like a different person. And I don't even recognize them. They're like, yeah, Pastor, I've been coming here six, seven months. I'm like, you don't even look like the same person. I'm not the same person. I feel so good. You know what happened? The grace exchange. They turned in their sorrow for his joy. They turned in their sickness for his healing. They turned in their depression for his, come on, victory. Somebody clapped like this, grace. I don't know about you, but I want some unearned favor. I want some gift. I want some, come on, give God a shout. Some of you are going to get married to somebody you didn't deserve. You're going to get a job you don't deserve. You're about to get a house you don't deserve. You're about to get a healing you don't. Oh, come on, somebody shout grace. Exchange. Can I keep going? Because if God does it, when I look at Liz, I don't sit there, my wife, I don't sit there and go, huh, suave, rico, suave. That ain't going to work. I look at my wife and I say, grace, 
to the humble. Come on, somebody. When I look at my three beautiful children, I never had a dad. I never had a healthy family. All I had was abuse, pain, chaos, brokenness, sorrow upon sorrow. I was talking to Liz last night. I said, my kids don't know that, babe. They don't know their parents divorced. All they know is me and you together. They don't deserve that. That's God's grace in their lives. I don't deserve them. That's God's grace in our lives. It's all God's grace. And if we recognize it as God's grace, that's God's grace, that's God's grace, and not try to take credit, then God says, I'll give more grace to the humble. And the more glory you give me for every little blessing, I'll increase blessing, and I'll do what the Bible says, grace upon grace, and favor upon favor, I'll multiply. How many are believing for a season of God's grace multiplying? Come on, Freedom Family Group leader. I believe God will multiply grace on your group. Wow. Yet, can I keep going? Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted, cursed. Verse 5, but he was wounded. See, when they saw him, when they saw him in Jerusalem, in Israel, when they saw him, they said he's smitten of God. He's afflicted. He's cursed of God. And they were right. Because on the cross, the Bible said he became a curse. And we're going to teach that. On that cross, he became your curse. He became your sin. He became your sickness. He became your poverty. You don't have to live on welfare for the rest of your life. The devil is alive. He took that on that cross. Grace exchange. They were right. Verse 5. But. Somebody shout but. But. I feel like preaching. Can I preach a little bit today? But. He was wounded. For my. Transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. Transgression is sins that we outright know about. How many know you sinned? You just flat out sinned. You got got, your hand in the cookie jar. You knew you messed up. I blew it. That's it. I deserve the death, hell, and the grave. I messed up. And God said, I was wounded for your failure. I was wounded for your outright disobedience. Come on, somebody. Now, don't, don't keep sitting like that. you mess yourself up. But then he turned around and said, and, and for your iniquity, I was bruised. Iniquity is generational curses. So everything that was on your mom, your dad, your grandpa, your grandma, perversion, molestation, early divorce, early pregnancy, alcoholism, drug addiction, sickness, cancer, disease. He said, I was bruised to break the bloodline curses in your life. Somebody ought to shout freedom. Somebody shout freedom. Wow. I dare you to give God a shout of praise like the anointing is going to break something off. Somebody say yeah. My God. My God. Let's keep reading. Somebody say the chastisement for our peace. Somebody shout, peace was upon him. And by, and by, and by, and by, and by, and by. One translation said, and with, and with, and by, and with. I don't care how it comes, but I just know. And by his stripes, I was healed. Come on, give God a praise. I feel. No, 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 no. Watch. If you praise him, watch what happens in the next 30 seconds. Come on. Come on. Come on. Shift. Come on. Shift this room. Come on. Somebody. Somebody shout grace. Shame. He didn't deserve that on the cross. I deserved it. There was a divine exchange. And all he asked me to do is to take it by faith. Because how many know whatsoever you ask, believing you what? The word receive means put your hand out by faith and take. 
Like the woman with the issue of blood, spiritually, she reached her faith out and took her power. She took her miracle. I pray sometime in the next four weeks, somewhere in this series, somebody's going to reach up the hand of faith and they're going to take their liver. They're going to take their new heart. They're going to take their freedom. They're going to take their deliverance. They're going to take their prosperity. They're going to go into the enemy's camp and they're going to take it and they're going to shine it and show it off. And the people are going to say, oh my God, look at, look at your new house and look at your car and look at your family and look at your body and you're so happy and you're gonna say oh i know i've been going to church and you know i'm changing my life you're gonna look at him and say no no my friend i had a divine grace exchange if it had not been for the lord that was on my side i wouldn't have made it but god has blessed me even when i didn't deserve it even when i didn't earn it grace exchange come on put your hands together give god a praise Somebody say, receiving the Father's grace by faith. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. It says, for by, read it with me, for by grace, come on, you have been what? What? Through what? And that not of what? It is a what? Come on, somebody say, it's a gift. Not of works, so you can't take credit for it. Who gets the credit for your salvation? Who gets the credit for your healing? Who gets the pr credit for your deliverance? Who gets the credit for your prosperity? Who gets the credit for all the family in your life that's serving God? Now, who gets the credit for anything good in your life? Who's going to get the credit? God's going to If you feel like you earned it, then you get the credit. But if you know he did it and you just received it by faith, then he gets all of the credit. How many know you received salvation? That, how did you receive salvation? Somebody preached about it. You heard it, you believed it, you received it. Whatever, we, whatever grace message we preach, you hear it, you believe it, you receive it. We preach on the grace for healing, you, you hear it, you believe it, you take it. You hear the prosperity, you hear it, you believe it, you take it. You hear deliverance, you hear it, you, you believe it, you take it. You hear about your family grace and God wants to save them, you hear it, you believe it, you take it. How many know faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God? And we're going to preach grace all the month of August. We're going to build your faith. And I'm telling you, people are going to begin. Some of you are going to get healed today. Some of you, as I'm preaching, are going to start getting healed. You're going to start getting recovered. Miracles are going to start. Ha Come on, somebody clap like this is powerful. Say amen, somebody. Now... I got about five more minutes, so let me wrap this up. This story of the prodigal son is a perfect illustration of the grace message of God. This is a great illustration of cross, Christ Calvary and humanity coming back to him. It's a message about a prodigal son, and he demanded his life. I want my life. I don't need you, Father God. The father represents God. The, man represent, the, the, the prodigal son represents mankind's sin, us. He says, basically, I don't need you. I don't need church. I don't need God. I'm going to do it my way. And he took his life. He took his talents. He took his gift. And he went out to the world. And he went and lived it up. And how many know the world, there's always a price to pay on sin. Sin has pleasure. Sin is fun. That's why people do it. But it only lasts so long. And then sin, the, the price for sin has to be paid, which is death. This young man starts paying the price for the sin. He starts, everything in his life starts falling apart. And now he finally realizes, man, I cannot do this without God. I need my father. I need my, my father's grace. So he comes back to the house of God. And here the story begins. Verse number uh, 50, uh, 20 says, and he arose, read it with me, and came to his father. But when his father was still a great way off, he saw him, I love this, and had compassion on him. And ran, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to even be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. Before I read verse 24, look at me. The next thing we're going to read about is the, the other son in the house. This was a religious boy. This boy was in the house. He never backslid. He never went to the world. But he was trying to earn blessing. Where we see where the son just received blessing. This young man, is, is the son that's in the house, is mad that his father is celebrating that his brother's coming back. And his attitude is that of a legalistic religious Christian. 
Verse 24. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and began to be merry. Look at the son though, the, the religious son. Verse 31. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. Verse 32. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and he was lost and now he's found. The younger son, watch me, didn't earn his father's grace. He just received it. So I could just imagine this younger son, he's out there, he's in the world, he's, he's, he's messed up, and he comes and he sees his father and he's saying, man, I don't deserve any goodness from him. I, I just want to, I just want see, his, he's, he ha, see, this is the power of a grace message because true grace produces repentance in somebody's life. So he's coming and he realizes, man, I don't deserve this, but I'm just going to humble myself and hopefully I get some grace here. He comes to the father and the father literally puts his arms around him. I need you to see this. And I could just see the son. He's literally got no shoes. I mean, imagine, seriously, if I took your shoes off and I let you walk all over the place for months and then you came in here with no shoes, everybody would be looking at your feet, huh? They'd be like, what's happening here? Like a homeless person. And we would just know, man, this guy's been through a lot. She's been through a lot. He's got no shoes, guys. His clothes are all raggedy. He smells like, like urine and pig, pig, pig. He just, he's, it's, he's in bad shape. And his father just walks up to him, puts his arms around like that. And he says, he goes, hey, bring me that robe. Put the robe on him. That's the robe of righteousness. I'll, we're going to preach that in August. Puts the robe of righteousness. The robe re represents forgiveness and healing. He says, boom, I'm going to cover you. And then he says, hey, put the ring on his finger. The ring represents the signet ring of kings. And that represents authority and prosperity. That's what the Pharaoh gave to Joseph. Joseph had nothing, but when he got that ring, everything changed. He had as much power as Pharaoh. And the father literally says, I'm giving you your inheritance back. I'm giving you your authority back. I'm giving you your prosperity back. And then he, then, and then he says, put the shoes on his feet. And that represents where there's shame. And he's gonna, he's, I'm going to put dignity where there was shame. And all of a sudden, this boy that was so messed up, it's like he got a makeover, a grace exchange. He didn't earn it. He didn't have to fight for it. He, he just received it. And I believe some of you are about to receive the forgiveness and healing of God. You're about to receive the authority and prosperity of God. You're about to receive, come on, where you, had, where you had shame, you're about to get dignity. Come on, give God a praise like you believe that. The other son, the other son, he's all mad because he represents the law. He represents legalism, trying to earn God's favor, trying to earn God's blessing, trying to be good enough to measure up. Listen, you're never going to be good enough to get your healing. You're never going to be good enough to get prosperity. You're never going to be good enough to get deliverance. You have to receive by faith what God has done for you already on the cross of Calvary. Come on, somebody give God a praise. Come on, somebody give God a shout. And that doesn't mean, oh man, I got grace now. I could act like any kind of way. And No, we find that this prodigal son never went back to prodigal living because he began to see himself the way God saw him. How many know you have to see yourself the way God sees you? And when you see yourself the way God sees you, you start letting go of that old lifestyle. You start letting go of that old sinful behavior. You start letting go. When the devil tries to put sickness on you, you say, devil, that doesn't belong to me no more. I'm a healed one. Get sickness off my body. I belong to the Holy Spirit. I am the temple of the living God. When poverty comes creeping back and tries to knock on your door, say, I'm sorry, poverty, but I'm not broke anymore. I'm rich because he died so I could be wrong. Come on, somebody talk. When, when depression comes creeping up, that spirit of depression, you say, I'm sorry, depression, but you ain't my portion. I ain't you no more. I'm healed. I'm whole. I'm blessed. I'm delivered. There was a grace exchange, and I am what God said I am. Somebody give God a praise like you're not going back to the pig pen of your old life, but grace is living lifting you higher somebody shout like there's a grace exchange and I'm going to wrap this up now and we'll close this up and I think how many would how many are excited about this series how many want to learn more about what Jesus Christ did for you on that cross in 2 Corinthians 5.21, I want you to, I want, I'm going to read this to you real quick. And I'm just going to talk to you about the robe of righteousness as we close. But the Bible says in Isaiah 61.10, He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, let's read together. Say, He made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. 
that we might become the righteousness of God. When he took our sins, he took our sicknesses as well. Now you're going to see an image up on the cross of this is what, when he was on the cross, here it says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin. So he, he didn't know sin, but that's what sin looks like. He didn't know sin. But God, the Father, made him to be sin. So you could become the righteousness of God. Right now, it doesn't matter if you know this or not. This is truth. Now, it does matter if it's going to affect your life. You have to believe this. But right now, based on the scripture I just read to you, you are just as right with God right now as Jesus is. Right now. And you're saying, no, pastor, I smoked weed on the way here. I, I cussed at the dog. I kicked the cat. I fought with my wife. See, that's behavior. And God works on behavior. He changes our behavior. But it's from the inside out. I'm going to drop something heavy on you. If you never see yourself the way God sees you, you're going to try to change on your own. And if you change, you're going to get the credit. But when you begin to see yourself the way God sees you, I am right with God right now, then all of a sudden you start living out of that place and you get a vision for who you are. All of a sudden you start saying no to what you used to say yes to. Wow. Come on, give God a praise. This is heavy, huh? Come on, give God a praise. This is good stuff, church. We're going to go there. This is, this is how it worked for me. God told me, you're, you're my preacher. 20, 23 years ago, he told me, right when I got saved, three months, you're, 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 you're my preacher. That's what he told me. You're, you look like my size when I was 23. Come on. 23 years ago, I mean. Okay. And God said, you're going to be a preacher. Okay? That's you. You're a preacher. Now all of a sudden, my old lifestyle would come. Temptation. Hey, Jay, what's up? And I'd say, like, push me away. And, I'd, and say this. Say, I'm a preacher. Preachers, talk to them. Say, I'm a preacher. Preachers don't do that. Don't do that. Then the hoochie mamas would come. Push me away. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I, all the sin that I used to be in bondage to, I, I, used to, I used to come to me and I used to push it away. And I said, I don't do that no more. I'm a preacher. I don't live like that no more. I'm a preacher. I, I, had, I, I, I hadn't preached one sermon, not one sermon yet, but I believed I was a preacher. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't do that no more. I'm a preacher. You said, push me away. Okay. They come like this, hey, uh, uh, hey, wait, 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 you think you're too good for us now? I'm sorry, I don't do that no more, why? Because I'm a preacher. And because I had a vision for who I was in God, guess what I am now? No, 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 you get, oh, come on, somebody clap like you're going to get hold of something. So what happens at, um, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not sick. I'm healed. No, nah, 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 get away from me. I'm not that. I'm healed. But the doctor said, I understand, but by his stripes I was healed. Get away from me. I am that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah I know, I know. I know there's pain, but by his stripes I'm healed. I'm not going to deny the pain. I'm just going to claim who I am. Somebody clap like pastors breaking it down, helping somebody. I know I'm helping somebody. I know I is helping somebody. <laughs> what about poverty? When poverty comes and hits you and takes your job, that curse, that family. See, some of you do good financially and then it comes. Boom. What about some of you that you keep smoking that crack and that speed? You keep going back to that, 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 that pipe, that bottle. 
because you don't believe you're the righteousness of God. I'm going to quit. I'm going to stop. I'm going to quit. And, and, and you quit for a week or two, a month, and then you go back. Why? Because you don't believe you are what God says you are yet. But I believe by the time we get done with this series, somebody in this room is going to start believing I am what God said I am. And I don't need that crack anymore. I don't need that hoochie mama no more. I don't need to sleep around no more. Why? Because I am what God said I am. And I will have what God said I can have. And I will be what God said I can be. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So, stand on your feet. We're going to walk this out together. We're going to teach. We're going to preach. We're going to do this all the month of August. And we're going to, we're going to emphasize something every week. This coming week, healing. And we're going to take communion next week. How many know somebody sick that needs to be healed? Who's going to earn their healing? Who deserves their healing? Nobody earns it. Nobody deserves it. But how many know he paid the price so you could be healed? And when you get healed, you're not going to walk around, look at me, heal. You're going to be so grateful. You're going to be so thankful. You're going to be so broken. The only thing you're going to want to do is go lay hands on somebody and heal the sick. Because if he did it for me, he can do it for you. If he prospers you, you're not going to walk around here arrogant, thinking you're all that. You're going to say, God bless my life. God prospered my life. When God restores your family, you're not going to be arrogant. You're going to be broken. You're going to be grateful. You're going to be thankful. Somebody lift your hands and begin to worship God like a divine exchange can happen this morning. Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, I receive everything you have done for me on the cross of Calvary. I declare that by your stripes, I was healed. I declare you carried my sickness. You carried my sorrow. You carried my sin. You carried my iniquity. You carried my failure. You carried my poverty. You carried my, you carried my anxiety. You carried my shame. You carried my condemnation. I am what you carried. I am delivered from the curse forever.